for the entire day. So, all right. But she's not here. Do you know anything about Site 17? Uh, no, no, that I'm aware of, other than that is flat and, and nothing is going on right now. All right. Um, all I know is that there is a, a, a company that was hired to do a study and put a proposal together, and that was presented a few weeks ago. Good. All right, well, stay tuned for next week's version of Site 17. Anyone else have anything to add and uh, offer? All right, we'll turn it over to Zool. And Randy, thank Randy. you. Randy, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to talk much because, first of all, we'll let Zool play as much as he can play today. Um, and he'll also tell stories in between when he takes breaks. So first, let, I met Zool Bailey. It was 1998 when I first had him perform with the trio uh, in Escondido. And since then, we have remained good friends, colleagues, uh, and uh, I've watched his career flourish. So uh, he joined Mesa Art Center as our guest artist, artistic director for classical music Inside Out, which is a complete rethinking of the process of, of presenting classical music in a community. It's primarily focused on community engagement that happens to have a performance. And for those of you that have had the opportunity to hear Zool play uh, in the past, uh, know that uh, you probably think, as I do, that it's absolutely amazing to hear him, hear him perform. Um, and he's going to talk about a couple of projects and recording session he did. I had the pleasure of listening to him play for four days, eight hours a day recording an album uh, that will come out soon and hopefully it will be his second Grammy award. So actually without any further ado, so Bailey, the stage is yours and turn on, uh, take your mic off of um, mute. Thank you, Thank you Randy. Um, yes, it is true. Um, I'm affiliated with the wonderful Mesa Art Center. Um, it actually began in 2012 officially because that's when this whole new chapter started. I played with them before that as a guest, but this idea was hatched. And this is my 10th anniversary, 10 straight years of working hand in hand with the Mesa Art Center. And this is how it all began. Uh, so I'm gonna play something for you right now. And this is, the, this is, the, this is the, uh, the hammer that cracked open the egg that created this wonderful collaboration. This is also what I was playing in the Mesa Art Center in January, which I'll tell you about as we get a little further in. This is Prelude Number no. Five by Johann Sebastian Bach. Just, just a little bit of a something to think about. Uh, we were just talking about cellos being old and from a long time ago. This cello was built in 1693 that you're listening to. Sadly, you're listening over Zoom. If you've heard, if you could feel it in the same room, it would rumble your legs. It, it shakes rooms. Um, and just to put in perspective, Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach was born in 1685. So Bach was eight years old and had written a note when this cello was born. So he was, this cello was in its twenties when uh, this piece was written. This is prelude number five in C minor. <laughs> Thank you. 
That's not rock and roll. I don't know what is. Heck yeah. <laughs> it. it's thrash around like I'm playing electric guitar. It's a great time. Um, <clears throat> so basically what I was telling you in 2012, I came to celebrate the Bach cello suites at the Mesa Arts Center. And for two and a half hours, <clears throat> I played the complete suites for um, the theater there. It seats 500. But I didn't just play. I told stories in between the suites. I told what people should be listening to, everything from the cello to how, why certain techniques are done, to what they should be listening for, to what Bach was intending to do romantically during things, as well as dances, as well as the use of the instrument. <clears throat> and basically what I did was I broke that wall down as hard as I possibly could between me and the audience. During that same time period, I was out in the, in the schools trying to bring music outside, <coughs> excuse me, of, of, the, of the concert hall themselves. I thought, well, those who know, go. And those who don't know, we have to go to them. Well, Randy Vogel said, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. We need to create a whole new series that has as big or bigger impact in the community. And we're gonna call it classical music inside out. And, and he asked me to be, at that point in time, basically a curator. So what I would do is I'd go into schools and they called it Zool in School. And I would come there for a week and a week or so at a time. And I would do these, what I, what I coined informances, information performances, because this is what makes classical music so invigorating. The more you know, the more you want to know. It's timeless. The word classic is timeless. It's so, it's so masterful. <clears throat> if like a great glass of wine, if you really appreciate wine, you can really taste the subtleties, especially if you're educated on what you're tasting. Same with classical music, same with food, same with fine fashion, same with art. <clears throat> and the impact has been tremendous. And we've been going 10 years strong now. And so um, in, the, in these residencies, I go into the schools, hospitals, pop-ups, libraries, television stations. We have a series and we go over to give master classes at ASU. We're on the radio. We're in retirement centers. We're at the country club. That's before we go to the concert hall. 
So we're reaching thousands and thousands and thousands of people prior to the people that want to come and hear the formal event. So by the time the, the week ends, we've covered, as I said, <coughs> best case scenario, maybe 5,000 people. Um, and our goal is to reach at least 10,000 plus young people in any given season um, through the schools and we have school programs. So I, it's been an amazing ride to do this and to, and to showcase and, and to make music accessible. Um, in fact, what, what, what's a, the next piece I wanna play for you, every time I play that kind of music, you know, people are like, wow, I didn't know I could like classical music so much. Do you play like video game music and movie stuff? Ugh. I, and I've been trying to figure out what, what, what you know, because what I play, I want to play well, and I don't want to play, you know, um... <laughs> We all know what that is. That's Darth Vader, but uh, that that's boring to me, and it, it doesn't sound very good just on solo cello. So <clears throat> I began trying to think, okay, what piece would rock their world, but in a different kind of way? Because it's always in life, not what you do; it's how you make people feel. So I decided to shock them with this piece of movie music. I'm not going to tell you what it is but um, we're gonna talk about it afterwards. But this is a, a very famous piece of music that at least all of you should know. Some of the young people uh, don't know this movie as well, but I'm sure you do. Tell me, this is gonna be a trick, a test. Tell me, first of all, if it makes you feel something, which it should, if it doesn't, you're dead inside. Uh, and, uh, and also what movie it's from. <coughs> Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. So that was Schindler's List. For those of you who recognized it or couldn't put it together, but it was originally written for Itzhak Perlman, uh, who was a frequent guest of the Mesa Art Center. <clears throat> and it was written by John Williams. And that proves right there that classical music doesn't have to be Haydn and Beethoven and Bach. It can be brand new, but John Williams is 90 years old this year. He's a living composer. It's contemporary music. But contemporary music can also be very melodious and very emotional. Obviously, that piece was written uh, about the Holocaust, World War II. So beautiful, originally for violin and orchestra, but um, I just thought, of course, the cello being so much like the human voice, with that same register and same range could really pull it off also. So I learned it during this pandemic, uh, being, being alone kind of in this house, just wanting to hear the beauty of music to kind of wash away this nonsense we're having to go through this year and, and find great hope and positivity. Um, so this year, <clears throat> we, are, we are planning, uh, you know, this, this whole past year, we had to go virtual like we're doing now, but we planned a, a terrific season of <clears throat> a lot of kind of sound investments, um, not only notables, people who are famous in the world, and, and you could look them up everywhere, but also a lot of rising stars. We're starting in October with an opera singer who does uh, a lot of uh, Broadway acting. She's comedic. She puts on a big show as one person. Her name is Shelly Watson. So she's opening our season this year. She did a terrific kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, impromptu live, super live uh, virtual thing for us that was such a success this year. We decided to bring her uh, live in person at the Mesa Art Center. And then in November, we have the, yeah, the Ataka String Quartet, which won the Grammy Award for Best Ensemble and Best Recording last year, the Grammy Awards. Uh, year before last. So we get to celebrate them, the Ataka String Quartet. Then to be a little different, we're also trying to bring in people that, that young people would identify with, with instruments that are very infrequently featured. Xavier or ha Javier Xavier Foley, a bassist uh, who won Young Concert Artists, will be coming in and <clears throat> performing with members of the community uh, in schools, as well as at ASU and myself. It'll be kind of a variety evening to showcase the versatility of the string bass. Uh, in March, we have a, a uh, an accordion player. Now that's an odd one for to, to feature, but it's not really this year because the world in 2022 will be celebrating the great Argentinian composer, Astor Piazzolla, the tango guy, uh, his hundredth birthday. So to do that, of course, you have to have an accordion player. So she's going to be coming in just like Xavier Phillips. Um, Xavier, how do you say it, Randy? I've said it. I would never correct you because there's always different ways of saying things, but Xavier <clears throat> Foley. Okay, Xavier, it starts with an X. You can say whatever you want. So the bass guy, um, just like him, um, it, it, she will be joined by a lot of different players from the community. We're trying to rally to give people a chance to work together and be a community again, which is what the arts are for us. I've always felt, <clears throat> and especially now, that the arts are a way for us to get together to celebrate life, to be inspired, to go back to our normal grind, and to think differently. And that's what the Mesa Arts Center is. So we, 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 we try to gather there to celebrate together. And then the final concert in April, uh, celebrates the, the world-renowned violinist Chi Yan um, from Korea. Uh, she lives in, in New York City and Dallas, as well as <clears throat> the great Russian pianist Natasha Peremsky, who's been to the Mesa Art Center before, and she's celebrated worldwide. You can look that up on YouTube. Any of these people, you'll, you'll be amazed at where they are all the time. As well as myself, I'll join them for an evening of chamber music, solos, duos, and trios. In addition to all of that, of course, we're going to be in the doing all the things we do. And um, one of the things that we also get to celebrate this year, which uh, Randy mentioned, is <clears throat> I was called in the fall by a, a record company named Octave Records. Um, and they asked if I would record the Bach cello suites again in my favorite venue in the world. Um, but the, time, the, the difference is this time, they're going to record it at 175 times the fidelity of a normal CD. It's called DSD, which means basically you can hear my blood flowing through my brain while I'm playing it, the mics are so hot. 
and you can hear everything from the, the texture from my bow on the string. <clears throat> and I chose my favorite place on earth, which is your Mesa Arts Center. So in the big hall, the Akita Theater, in November, I sat there, or excuse me, January, I sat there for one week. Everybody had masks on. I was the only one allowed in the hall. Um, and I recorded the complete Bach cello suites, which comes out in about three weeks worldwide on DSD, super audio. Um, and so we get to celebrate the world, the, the world premiere of possibly a world record, the Mesa Arts Center, this glorious cello that was built during Bach's lifetime, the 10th anniversary of my being the artistic director of the Mesa Arts Center's Inside Out series, as well as the fact that there's lighted into this pandemic tunnel. It's all a big celebration. Uh, I'm going to play one more piece for you, and then we're going to open it up for some questions. There's nothing like a hoedown. And so I want to play a hoedown for you. It's written by an American composer, Lucas Foss. It's called Capriccio. And uh, it sounds like I'm riding a horse through the, the Wild West and using my reins and slapping like this and doing all this crazy stuff with my bow. It's a fun piece called Capriccio by Lucas Foss. And while I'm playing, think of your questions you might want to ask at the very end. It's about a four minute piece by Lucas Foss. <laughs> Thank you. 
past it. Are you the only one coming? <clears throat> so, any final questions or comments or? I'll start off with a question for you, Zul. How about that? Sure. Can you talk a little bit about your cello? It's sure. a very special <clears throat> cello. It really is a special cello. This cello, as I said, was built in 1693 in Venice, Italy, by a man named Matteo, with two T's, Gofriller, two F's, two L's. And, um, and it's one of two cellos in the world that has a special marking on it. I don't, I, I'm a big movie fan, and my favorite movie of all time is Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if you know that movie well, you know the Staff of Ra. And at the top of the staff of Ra is this medallion. And that medallion is basically here underneath this fingerboard right there. You can barely see it. I don't know if I can. Uh, let's see, if, maybe this way. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Oh, it, it, it's, uh, it looks like, a, like the, side, the side of a church, like a stained glass window. And <clears throat> this was one of the first cellos this man made when he broke away from his master. And he took incredible care to craft it with everything possible on it. And going back to the evolution of the cello, when you were talking about five strings, four strings, this black part here, the fingerboard, ended before the rose would have been seen. You would have seen the rose. It would have been like on the front, like a stained glass window. You can see it there, I think. Um, but that it was covered up over the years because the fingerboard got longer and longer. And um, but it's 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 a miraculous cello. It was built as a bass, um, and so it was not cut down. So it sounds very different. I like to 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 um, associate it as the James Earl Jones of cellos. <laughs> Question: uh, What do you think of the Grand Canyon Suite, and do you play it? Parts of it. Um, isn't the Grand Canyon Suite for full orchestra? Pardon me? Isn't the Grand Canyon Suite for full orchestra? I, you can't pull, I, I guess you hear all the different squeaks and wheels and everything. And yes, it is full orchestra. There's no way to pull out uh, a cello piece. Um, again, I, I try, yeah, probably, but you'd have to give me a little time on that one. Oh, but uh, but yes, I know it. I love it. But I've in in my past and my history with that piece, I've been on stage with fifty other people, and we've gone crazy together, and and that and everybody goes nuts. And I, if unless I could pull that off, yeah. I, I try to stay away from pieces that it, it's going to only be like, a, uh, it didn't really work so well. Oh, I love but, you. But you've got good taste. It's a great piece. <laughs> so so we're hitting our one o'clock time. There's one thing I wanted to do. Um, most importantly, thank you, Zul, for your time. Thank you for your commitment to the community. But there's a very important person in Mesa that uh, especially that I know a lot of people on our Rotary Club know that if you see him, we, we hope that you will thank him and thank him often. And that is Bill Passy. Bill Passy, uh, if it were not for Bill Passy, this program would not be in 10 years of running. Uh, when Bill Passy first heard this show, I heard Zool play, he immediately got behind our classical music inside our program and has been a wonderful supporter of it. So um, I would, and he bought Zool a cello locally that can be used for uh, purposes. It's right, it's right behind me. In fact, I have it here because I, I brought it because I drove. The carbon fiber instrument, it's right there. Yeah. So anyways, I just wanted to add that in there. Um, and thank you, Zul and Ben, do you have, mm. or Joe, is there something that you guys want to do or say? I want to say one more thing. Uh, Bill Passy is the example. We could not do this without the community support, without the school support, without the people coming to the concerts. I mean, obviously, if you, if you build it and they don't come, you can't keep doing it. Uh, so the support of the community keeps us afloat and keeps us moving forward and keeps the arts alive. And that includes you. So um, obviously, I'm, I'm just making it very obvious that I'd love to see you at some of our events. I'd love to see you be part of our family at the Mesa Arts Center for Classical Music Inside Out. And your support would mean the world. And also, more importantly, your friendship 
and as a, a way to stick it together and celebrate because um, you know it, it it is the most amazing feeling to be a performer and look out and see your friends in the audience and I can see all of you right now so I am looking for you next time I come into the audience and, um, and look at I'll be like this so thank you for your your continued support and thank you for letting me speak to you today Zul thank you very much and I know, I don't know if your time permits, but if you're willing to stick around for just a few more minutes, I wanted to conclude our meeting so members can leave that must leave. And if you're willing to stay for a few minutes after, there may be a few more questions. Is that possible? Sure. Yes. And just uh, to the whole, the entire club, uh, the art center we, we know is a gem in the community. And going into the next Rotary year, I think we ought to consider how our club might be able to, at, at the very least, become a member or in some way lend some support to the art center. It's it's had a real tough year, and um, and there are, there are some creative ways that we could attend maybe some of the concerts and programs in the near future as a club, but but with you know your uh, suggestion and Randy's input and others in the club, I'm. I'm sure there's a way we could pull something off like that. There are some creative ideas uh, here or minds that will will come up with some ideas. So again, thank you, Zul, and stick around for just a few more minutes if you would. It was an incredible program and just one more great reason to be a member of this club. Our goals are to cultivate membership, support the community, support youth services, and we're enjoying it every every time we meet. This is the 49th meeting of this virtual setting. Uh, next week, we're going to have Jennifer Cruz. She's with Desert Sounds right here in Mesa, and she's uh, got a nice program for us. May 12th, the Rotary Action Group. It's going to be all about peace, and we are a Peace Builder Club, one of only, I think, 300 in, in the world. And maybe we'll have some ideas after that meeting on how to build on that peace initiative. On the 19th, the economic development of Mesa will be discussed. The next three years of economic development, Bill Jabjiniak will be here. And the last Wednesday of the month will be the 26th. And that's dark because that's Memorial Day and that's a break for our club. So what an incredible program. And you know, it's only one o'clock, so we still have a chance to make this day outstanding. We're off to a good start. Thank you for being here and we'll see you all next week. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jared. I hey. have a question. Oh, Chaz. Okay, you first. Okay. Sorry to butt in. Uh, <laughs> Joel, uh, obviously, you didn't buy that cello new. How does one come to own a 300-year-old instrument like that? Uh, there's either a credit card debt or theft. <laughs> no. I, I see you as a thief. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if I were a thief, I wouldn't be living and talking to you and playing it. I'd be living in South America someplace and not playing it for anybody, but for myself. So um, Chaz is an attorney, so that's good. I am, um, you know, 23 years ago, um, an angel came into my life uh, and bought the cello for my lifetime use. Wow. wow. So do, do you have to wait until somebody dies before you can get a cello like that or what? Well, there's got to be a story of a long story of who owned it and how'd you get it. There, there is a 326 year old story. <laughs> uh, and, and I only know about a hundred years of that. Um, there were three players in the 1900s. The most famous of those three players uh, was Misha Schneider of the Budapest String Quartet. And he had it for 38 years. Um, I've already had it for 23 years. Um, and uh, there was a woman that lived in L.A. who bought it from him, who was in the L.A. Philharmonic, but was also a nun. Um, and she did. She thought the cello was too good for the orchestra, so she never played it in the orchestra. But when she sold it uh, to this patron, um, it, it was, the, the money was church property. So she didn't gain financially on the sale of it. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's it's. They've become, they're not just tools, as you know, they are pieces of art. And so um, the condition of this is so immaculate that clearly it was in a collection for a long time and, and 
not and spared the kind of wear and tear of normal traffic because yeah you know, 100 years ago even 100 years ago they carried these things around in soft leather bags imagine the accidents and the things that could happen to anything if you carried around in a soft bag um now i have these fancy cases like this one over here and i've got a carbon fiber case but you know my job and these you know in general you, we have to think about life this way we are just the caretakers for everything you know, we're the caretakers for this earth, we're the caretakers for uh, our families, uh, you know, whatever. It, 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 we, yes, I, ownership, what does that mean? Uh, but I do know that I, I get to play it until I'm dead. And then the only issue they'll have is they'll have to pry it out of my cold, dead hands because <laughs> I'll, I'll be like this, saw through it. Hey, I got a question. Um, speaking of hands, is your left hand still larger than your right hand? Or I yeah. Know. So um, the the quick quick story is from practicing so much as, as a kid, I stretched out the palm of my left hand uh, from stretching around the cello. The the right hand. I mean, we all we all of our bodies kind of adapt to sitting in a computer, or you know driving or whatever we do, um, but my fingers, this is the way I, I play. So this fingers, there's so much pressure on this finger that it's become bent. I mean, it, 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 it's just, it kind of points that way, even when I stick it straight up. So that's my small hand because that's all it does. It just grips. But the big hand has stretched out a lot um, through here. And, and you can see, you can't, it's hard to see the, the real difference. But look, you can see how this one kind of goes and keeps going compared to the other one. Um, wow. I, I, can, I can literally palm a basketball easily with this hand, and I can palm a, a decent sized melon with this hand. <laughs> but, but that's good because, but that's also kind of like, you know, I felt like when I found my cello, it was like <laughs> Thor's hammer. Because um, when the guy, the, the, the luthier, the, the, the dealer said so, what do you think? I'm like, it's perfect. He goes, you're not in pain? I said, what do you mean? Why would I be in pain? He goes, this is a very large cello. People can't play this cello. And he said, he's, I said, I can. <laughs> and that was because my hand was the, the perfect shape for this cello. So it's like pulling the sword out of the, of the stone. I, I did it and I kept it. Nice. That's cool. So well, I have a question, uh, Joe Wilson, and it has to do with um, being an educator as you are and the way you do work with our youth here. What influences have you received from working with young people or what stories do you have where you've seen the influence with them? Well, great question. Um, <clears throat> I, I see first of all i am in music and music is my life and the way i am as a human being is because of the arts they 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 have given me a safety of of self to be a communicative trusting uh, expressive person um that is because i had music in my youth um i have found you know i i played at a prison one time well it was just a couple of years ago san quentin and one of the prisoners um, became visibly shaken. Um, and after I finished playing, stood up, gave me his number and his name and said, sir, I have been in this prison for 27 years. And this is the first time that I've cried in 27 years. And I want to know why the sound of your cello is making this happen. Um, I immediately looked around to all the inmates and I said, I need you to answer one question. What is the opposite of love? And they literally all shouted hate, which makes sense. Uh, I said, yeah, I don't see it that way. I see the opposite of love as indifference. And I said, and the scariest thing in life is when you become numb and you don't feel. And I tell you, when I go into a room and I, I face the audience as I'm facing you now, and I'm playing for 800 elementary school kids, and they're quiet for 45 minutes and not moving, and hundreds of them have their eyes shut while I'm playing. 
That's magic. And that goes back to what I was saying about it's not what you do, it's how you make people feel. And for whatever reason, um, I have been given the torch to be able to do this and to want to do this. And, and I do, I look in the audience as well. I can tell when someone's had that day in the audience when I'm playing a concert. I can tell when this is the, the escape, the music is the escape, the power of music to make them forget they're in present versus worrying about tomorrow or what they did during the day. So education to me isn't just facts and figures. Education is the exploration of what makes us human and what makes us be able to function with other humans um, and feel okay that it's okay to do that. So when I play, I, I mean this when I tell you this, the way I'm speaking to you right now is the way I speak to a first grader or a second grader. I don't dumb anything down. And they speak to me in ways that you would be, it would blow your mind. I played the Brahms lullaby. You know that this, you know this piece. Um, Played this for about 400 kids and <clears throat> afterwards I said they didn't know I, just, I didn't tell them what it was they didn't know it was Brahms who wrote it um, they just knew that it was that piece and two people I said so what did it make you feel and two people raised their hands one girl and one boy and they were both probably in third grade and the woman the girl said I feel like I'm in a boat rocking back and forth and I, my eyes are shut, but I'm thinking of my mommy and it's wonderful. I said, well, that's wonderful because that's the piece is kind of a rocking piece. And I said, young man, what did you feel? He said, I feel like the day that my dad left and never came back. Oh. I said, thank you for sharing. Um, that's a magnificently strong feeling. Um, and um, let me play something else for you now. I mean, I just, but you know, I would never have guessed in a million years that the Brahms lullaby would make someone feel abandoned. And this gives me goosebumps, me telling you these stories. This is what brings me back. And it, all it takes is one. And by the way, more importantly, everybody in the, that, that, um, facility, the multi-purpose room, heard him say that. And by the way, he heard him say that too, which means that's kind of therapy in a really weird way. He, he admitted to the loss of something very important to him. So, um, you know, my, my, my informances, my school visits, don't just say, hey, look at how fast my fingers are, let me play something you know. I am trying to take them on a journey to make them feel and to make them excited and to make them feel human. If they wanna play the cello, fantastic. If they wanna appreciate the arts, even better. If they realize that being creative and expressive is the arts, are the arts in your own way, even better. But I, I have been around long enough to realize that we've been through about almost two cycles at the Mesa Arts Center in these 10 years. And what I, what I mean by that is this, Think about your own childhood and what you really remember and those, those, those kind of cemented memories. They start at about eighth grade. You remember from eighth grade and certainly all of high school, but, you, but fifth grade down, you, you kind of remember, but the, the, the impacting things that really did change as you were growing and the hormones and stuff like that were about a five or six year window. And we at the Mesa Arts Center have changed two complete generations of people that assume that that is normal, that the, the arts in their school and being able to feel and to know what a cello is and know that they can go appreciate the arts and be human and go away to school, <clears throat> that is the gift of a lifetime because that's when the programming and the wiring is done. So 10 years like that, 
My hope is that we continue to do this for another 10 years. And that's why, you know, we're always just rallying because we're, we're caretakers. Going back to the cello, we're caretakers for our own, our own community. We have to leave it better than we, when we got here because we're here because of the people before us. And the grass is greener where you water it. And we have to, we have to water it. And that's not what it sounds like. We have to be kind and pay it forward in any way we can. And we do it through what we do at the Mesa, Mesa Arts Center. So that's what brings me back every day. Well, Mesa community is extremely fortunate to have your impact and what you do in our community. Uh, I just, it sent me chills talking about some of the things and the impact you have on young people as an educator myself. So thank you, thank you so much. And, and thank you, Randy, for finding you and bringing you to the center. We really appreciate it. Thank you.